Hello and welcome to Life Lessons. This is Judy Simon on Israel National Radio. For today's show, we are honored to host Professor Eliezer Jaffe. Professor Jaffe is a researcher and a teacher. He made Aliyah in 1960, and I believe that it's safe to say that he changed the face of the country with his Aliyah. He is one of the founders, he is the founder of the School of Social Work at Hebrew University, and he is the recipient of various awards. In 1996, he, was, he received the President's Citation for Outstanding Volunteer Work. He's received the Mayor of Jerusalem Award for Outstanding Nonprofit Work. He's also received the Bernard Revel Award for Scholarship. And in 2011, last year, he received the Special Speaker of the Knesset Award. He's authored numerous books, too many to mention, including books on, don- on charities, such as Giving Wisely and Sources for Funding. He's actually authored a number of books on adoption, including Intercountry Adoptions and and Hannah Wept. He's written a book on the neighborhood of Yamin Moshe, named after uh, Moshe, Moses Montefiore. And he's written a book called Letters to Yitz, which I believe is very popular and no longer available, if I'm not mistaken. Professor Jaffe, first of all, I just want to say thank you for, for taking the time out to be on the show and to tell us your story. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Um, we always start our show by asking about your grandparents. Will you tell us who your grandparents were, Professor Jaffe? Well, the odd thing is, I never once said the word Saba or Safta, and I never heard anybody, a Saba or Safta, call me as, you know, their nechid, because my, uh, on my father's side, they, uh, he stayed in Lithuania, in a small village about 30 kilometers north of Vilna. Mm-hmm. And he did not come on Aliyah. And my father came to America as a 14-year-old boy to work and to make his way. The same thing with my uh, mother. She came from Poland as a 15-year-old girl to work in a sweatshop in Cleveland, Ohio. And they met in Cleveland, Ohio, which is where I was born. So I never really knew or had, you know, you know grandparents. Of grandparents. Wow. That's why I so love it now. I have now, thank God, 17 grandchildren. Wonderful. And it's one of the biggest blessings that I can wish on anybody. <laughs> grandchildren. So what kind of home did your parents create for you growing up? So we had a national, we had a religious Zionist family. Um, my parents were very Zionist. Um, and then uh, I was active in, uh, at that time, an organization called Hashomer Hadati. Hashomer Hadati was in Chutzlau. It's really the beginnings of Bnei Akiva. Right. And uh, I was head of the Shomer Hadati branch in Cleveland. My brother, Yitz, Yitzchak, Zichonu Yivracha, he uh, was planning to make Aliyah, and they asked him to be serve as a Rosh Hachshara. They had a training school in Cranberry, New Jersey, and they asked him to head that, and he was there for a year or more. And and then that's where he met his his wife and his great love, Miriam, and they got married, and they stayed in the United States. Now, Yitz was murdered in a in his office, in his place of work, in a holdup. And then Miriam and the rest of her family, all of them made Aliyah. They are all living in Israel. and um, But he is buried in Cleveland, Ohio. Hmm. Were you inspired by your brother Yitz? Very much so. He was a serious guy. He was a, he's a, he was a real Zionist. You know, there are a lot of people, religious people, who are who call themselves Zionists, and they are Zionists. But when it comes to making Aliyah, and this was way back in the 1960s when I came, and uh, I had come in 1957 to volunteer in one of the Ma'abarot in Jerusalem, a transient camp. Oh, wow. And it was hard on my parents. Because when you got down to it, you know, a son goes away, six thousand miles away, or, and 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 that's scary. But I believe that that was the thing to do. What influenced me so much is 
the idea of the ingathering of the exiles, I took that seriously. And uh, what made it serious for me, what added to it, was the Shoah. We could have all been murdered in the Shoah. If my parents had not come to America as young as teenagers, our whole family, there wouldn't be a family. There wouldn't be grandchildren. There would be no trace of it. And I took it very seriously that this chain of exile had to stop, and I was wanted to be, you know, uh, part of that. And I was very, very, very convinced that I am going on Aliyah, and I did. You worked in the transit camps, the Ma'amarot, yes. which yes. were like tent cities set oh, up yeah. for the olim, the, the new immigrants that came to Israel during a time where the country was so poor and had so little to offer, and yet there were so many people that came in and they were wanted. It's just that it was very hard to, to service them. For a kid that grew up in a comfortable Jewish home in Cleveland, was that a bit of a culture shock to you? Um, in 1957, when I came to do that, it was a culture shock because many people abroad <clears throat> live with the concept of, you know, land of milk and honey and land of our forefathers, and then you get to you get to Israel and you see a real country. You see a country being born. You see a country growing, a country working its way and developing itself into a, 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 um, a thriving, you know, uh, economy and uh, community. And so on the one hand, I saw the, the, the shock of what I thought, you know, there would be here. But on the other hand, I saw the reality. When I saw the reality, I made a decision that I would come on Aliyah again, and, but I would come back with a doctorate. I wanted to have a, uh, a highest degree in, by the way, in social work, and I felt that it was really important to be involved in policy making in the area of social services, and that's exactly what happened. When I finished my doctorate at uh, Case Western Reserve University, mm-hmm. I was asked to come to help set up the School of Social Work as the first school of social work in the country at the Hebrew University. And I was, within months, I was on the boat and arrived in Haifa and was teaching. So how does it feel to have shaped what social work means to the entire country? I mean, you were... A pioneer in every sense of the word. Uh, yeah, I, I agree with that because when I was in Israel, you could count the number of academic social workers, academic people with academic degrees, on less than two hands. Mm-hmm. And um, and um, a while back, I was a, a keynote speaker at the conference, the national, the annual conference of the National Association of Social Workers. And there were over 5,000 social workers. Wow. And the nice thing was that after the Hebrew University set up a basic model of how to, what to teach, um, all the other universities followed suit. When Tel Aviv was born, they had to have a school of social work, Bar Ilan, Haifa, Be'er Sheva, and today some of the colleges. You can't have a really serious university without a social work department. And as I walk around, you know, I, I visit different places in the country, I run into my students. I mean, wow. it's just it's a tremendous pleasure to, to mm. see what they've done and where they are and the positions that they have and how influential they are. It's a, it's a, it's a great reward to being part of creating a new profession in Israel. Well, you mentioned earlier in the show that you have 17 grandchildren. I'd like to propose that you have thousands of grandchildren. Okay. Really. All of the social workers in Israel are like your children and grandchildren because you made social work in Israel what it is today. Yeah. You know, the nice thing is that I have four kids. Two of my twin girls are both psychologists mm-hmm. with very serious positions. One is head of uh, child welfare um, psychology in the Gush, Gush Etzion. The other one is the chief psychologist at Aline Hospital mm. for handicapped children. Another daughter, my oldest daughter, is a family medicine doctor, a specialist. 
And my son is the head of a unit in the Tel Aviv municipality that works with uh, social services, volunteers, and uh, philanthropists. So You must I'm have done something proud. right. Yeah, I'm very <laughs> proud of that. By the way, my wife, I met my wife when, during the first year when I started teaching at Hebrew University. She was a, a um, public health nurse who came to study social work. And she was my age, and a beautiful girl, very talented, and we married a year later. So she was a social worker as well, as a public health nurse. So it's in the family. Okay, so Professor Jaffe, you started your social work career, if you want to call this the beginning, when you were in the transit camps, the Ma'abarot. Tell yeah. us what you saw. What did you do there? Well, there was a program that was set up by the Jewish agency called PATWA, the Professional and Technical Workers Association or program. And I was invited to work in the Mabaot with a, a senior Hadassah psychiatrist who was trying to help people to learn how not to spread disease. Mm-hmm. In these tin hunts and tin huts and in the in the tents, the the conditions were absolutely unbelievable. They were just terrible. And disease was spreading from family to family. And and so they wanted to prevent that. So they had, they were looking for volunteers to come in to explain and to try to work with the families about how to avoid diseases. And also to look at some of the social problems that uh, that were found in the camps. And in fact, out of the camps came the whole concept and service called foster care mm. because people outside the camps were asking to take on foster children from the camps. Mm. So that was the beginning of foster care in Israel. And uh, it just was an unbelievable thing. All people from all countries, and in the winter when it was terrible weather, There were no roads. It was all mud. I mean, it was unbelievable. In fact, my wife, when she was working as a public health nurse, they used to take the nurses in the morning in jeeps and drive them and drop them off in these various uh, villages in the Judean hills. And in the evening, they came back and they picked them up and brought them back to Jerusalem. So it was just an unbelievable time, and we had so much poverty I don't know how the country did it. There were 600,000 Israelis who absorbed another 600,000 within ten, less than 10 years. It's unfathomable. I don't know of any country that could do that and do it as well as we did. Wow. How has social work changed over the past 50 years or so? Social work has a strong American influence, somewhat British, but also American influence. The difference here is that the Americans, they have this Bachelor of Science, and then you go on and you get a Master's of Social Work. We didn't have time for that. So we have a three-year, we had set up a three-year program where the first year was basic general studies about economics, statistics, history, all this stuff, political science, sociology. And then the second two years were basically the social work curriculum, which was almost identical to the two years of the master's degree in America. Mm. In fact, when our students, our graduate students, went to America to get their master's, they were accepted with a, with, a, uh, with a bonus. Many of their Israeli classes were accepted as courses that didn't have to be taken again. But then it became very, very, I mean, not only became, but it had a very strong Israeli local reality piece to it, the research that's done, on our problems, the, uh, some of the theories of work, some of the understanding of methods of work, um, where social problems came from, the whole idea of cultural differences mm. between uh, Israeli citizens and the social workers. The social workers in the beginning were mostly Ashkenazi. Their clients were overwhelmingly Sephardi. Mm. And uh, that changed after an experiment that I did at the University. 
and that has now become part of the mission's concept. So social work has, you know, is an Israeli local thing with a strong American influence and 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 background. Professor Jaffe, you sort of became an expert on adoption, particularly intercountry adoption. Tell us yes. about that. One of the pieces of research, my area was child welfare. I did my doctorate on child welfare and a piece of it. And what I was seeing when I got here was that many, many children were being placed away from home because of poverty, not because of their parents or, you know, abuse or things like that. And then I found, as I got deeper into it, that one of the areas which was really um, sad to watch was that infertile couples, couples who could not have children on their own, were going abroad looking for babies to bring back and to adopt. They went to South America, first to South America, and then, of course, and then all over the place. But what happened was the Ministry of Welfare was the sole, the adoption department of the Ministry of Welfare was the sole representative for anything international. Now, no government abroad would work with another government regarding adoption of their children. It's embarrassing for them. So most of the adoption work abroad is done by nonprofit, professional, certified, adoption agencies, Private. which we did not have in Israel. It mm. was illegal to do it on your own, and it was illegal to set up an agency to do it. And so I took a year off. I took a sabbatical. My wife and I traveled to, to uh, 15 countries mm. to learn their adoption laws and what they needed to be able to, to have children adopted by Israel. And then I wrote a book. And then it became an issue in the Knesset, and I was asked to help write a new adoption Policy. section on intercountry adoptions, which allowed nonprofit organizations for the first time to do international adoptions. And the number of adoptions tripled and quadrupled mm. almost overnight. Do you also help families find foster care or? Families that want to do foster care help them find children? Well, yeah. Well, here, where that's an Israeli local issue mm. because the, the foster care situation are usually for Israeli, you know, born kids. And the department, the department of Foster Care and the Ministry of Welfare, which is really doing a nice job. I mean, they're working hard at it. And that's the other thing, by the way. When I came to Israel, the accent was on placing children in institutions. Mm. including Aliyah Tanor. And the problem was they were really cutting these kids off from their families because the families were poor and because the housing was very crowded. So uh, we made a big push to go to expand the foster care, which really was not cutting the child off from his own parents and which was giving him a family situation. Mm -hmm. And that was really important. So that was really the a tremendous development in the, the rise of foster care in Israel. Tell me if I'm wrong. From what I understand, uh, Israeli families uh, foster Israeli children or adopt foreign children, but it's not so common to find Israeli families adopting Israeli children. Is that correct? Uh, well, well, first let's get straight. Adoption is, is adoption. A child becomes your child. Right. In every sense of the word. In every sense of the word, legally, and inheritance, and everything. And foster care is where a family has agreed and wanted to take care of a child for a temporary period of time until that child's situation stabilizes or the family situation stabilizes. They are really in place of parents, but they are not parents, okay? Mm -hmm. So adoption, since there are only about 70 babies a year in Israel available for adoption, and there were close to 1,000 uh, applicants hmm. for babies to, ad for adopt, to adopt, people went abroad. There were no babies. There were no kids available. Mm -hmm. And that's how that whole thing started. Professor Jaffe, another one of your areas of specialty is 
in the area of charitable giving or fundraising, I yeah. guess, which is really two sides of the same coin. Yeah. How did you become involved in that? Well, I took a, you know, when I got looking at some of the organizations in Israel that are dealing with child welfare and social services, I found a huge community of nonprofit associations. And that intrigued me a lot, you know, the size of it, the, what we call the third sector. The first sector is government. Second sector is business. The third sector is the nonprofit sector. And, you know, I watched some of the work that they were doing, which was fantastic. And, and then the government, by the way, after Reagan was elected, the government decided to cut back on its own spending and buy services from the nonprofit sector, which gave the nonprofit sector a huge boost in its uh, income. And uh, so, so we have about 30,000 registered nonprofits. Hmm. And then the question that I asked myself or was intrigued with was, how do the nonprofits fund themselves? Mm -hmm. Where do they get the money to do their work? What about philanthropy, private philanthropy? What about these uh, contracts with government? I got into that whole thing and developed the area uh, in academia also of the study of philanthropy and the study of fundraising because they're very much related. Mm -hmm. They're the two partners. The fundraisers are trying to make a shiduch with the philanthropists you know, and the nonprofits. And that's just a fascinating area. And since it really was not an area for research or not an area for discussion, and the whole concept was based on this idea of snoring, mm. which was, was ridiculous, that I decided to study it. I decided to study it and to teach it, and to set up a program at the Hebrew University, and uh, with a degree in the, in the area of nonprofit management. Hmm. So, you know, all these topics that I got involved with, they flow from, from, from things that you see. They flow from reality. They flow from, from your interest. You yes. want to know why. And you have to learn it, you know. And then when you learn it, you can teach it. You saw a need and you addressed it. No question about it. No question about it. Professor Jaffe, we've come to the end of the first half of the show. We're going to take a break for a minute for some commercials. We'll be right back with more of your story. And I'd like to hear some more, some more advice or, or words of wisdom that we can walk away with. So hang on. We'll be right back. from Beachwood, Ohio. I like Israel National Radio because it's the best independent source of news all about Israel. Keep up the good work. Hi, my name's Brian. I'm from Manchester, and I love Israel National Radio because it reminds me where my real home is. Shalom. This is Nelson Yaltsin, comedian from Jerusalem, and I love Israel National Radio because it's genuine. You're listening to IsraelNationalRadio.com. second half of Life Lessons, and it is our pleasure to be in the middle of a conversation with Professor Eliezer Jaffe, who is the founder of the School of Social Work at Hebrew U, which is really the, the blueprint for all the schools of social work at all of the universities and colleges in Israel. And Professor Jaffe also specializes in adoption, particularly inter-country adoption, and also in giving wisely, both in terms of the, the fundraiser, the shidduch, the connection between the philanthropist and the nonprofit organization and the fundraiser that makes that shidduch. Professor Jaffe, I, I wanted to ask you, as a, a, a social worker who's also somebody who's studied and lives a life of Torah, where do you see the connection between the Torah world and the world of social welfare? Well, you know, Torah was meant to be used, and uh, the things that were taught, the principles, the ethics, the approach to people, you know, being a dame these are things that are not just slogans. And when you translate that into action, you get into these things that we've been talking about. I really, you know, and I also, I never count mitzvot. I never count mitzvot. When I see a problem and I think I can be helpful, I do it, but I never count it. I, the people that count, you know, it's okay with me, but 
but then they're all going to go to heaven, you know. Mm. I don't care about sitting in the front row. I mean, <laughs> sit in the back. But the main thing is to do mitzvot, to do, uh, you know, masik tovim. This is part of our Jewish culture. This is how the Jews survived. You know, many of the, in the, most of the countries where the Jews were in exile, there were services. And the, the only way you could get those services was by declaring that you're not a Jew. So what the Jews did was they set up their own institutions, you know, educational, charitable, even medical. You see that around the world, in the Western world, to survive as Jews, to keep their own, you know, their, their, their kashrut, and to take care of their own people without going to necessarily to be dependent on non-Jewish governments. Well, you know, taking care of people is a basic premise of the Jewish religion. It, you know, it's it's if people, you know, there's so many people that talk Jewish, but when you look at their activity, they're really they're really not involved. They're cut off. They're so busy with themselves, and they're so busy with with uh, you know just uh, trying to get to heaven mm-hmm. that they really forget that they live in a world where there are other people around who have problems. So the ones that are doing this stuff, I mean, are really my very good friends, and I appreciate them, and I think they're really the epitome of what I think is Jewish. Mm. You know, what you talked about, that the Jews always had to take care of themselves because they had no one else to count on. So they would set up all their own little chesed right. organizations right. and their gemachs. Sometimes they were criticized for that because they were they were looked upon as only taking care of their own. And I feel like now that we have our own country, the world sees they were actually not that way. Israel is the first country to be there for another country that goes through some sort of a tragedy or a trauma, be it from natural causes such as an earthquake or a, or a tornado or, or a hurricane or, God forbid, a bombing. Even enemy countries we've helped, and That's sometimes right. we do it quietly so as not to get recognition because they request that of us. That's right. I think it's just amazing. People don't uh, around the world that really have not grasped what the was amazing, amazing thing that Israel is as a country and as a people. I mean, we've done the very little PR, but but I agree with you. I agree with you. The other thing that you mentioned, you know, about about uh, you know Gamachim, and uh, you may be interested in this. In 1990, when the big Russian and Ethiopian Aliyah came in. Uh, up the street from my house, they turned a hotel into a uh, absorption center, and I went up to see it. I took my kids up to see it, and there they were, the buses coming in from Lud, and the Russians and Ethiopians in this hotel, you know. And then when I got home, I saw this on the news, and then I decided you cannot be here in Jerusalem watching this on the news and sitting in your armchair without getting involved. Mm. So I got some friends together, and we started thinking, what could we do? And we thought maybe we'd have some, you know, distribution stores, warehouses for furniture or for clothing or even food. But basically we went back to the to the Rambam, to Maimonides, who said, give a person a loan or a job so they can stay on their feet mm. and be independent. And so we created the Israel Free Loan Association. Mm. And that is not a small gemach. It's not a neighborhood gemach. And it's not just for Orthodox people. It's for Israeli citizens who are of low income, who can, who need these loans and have the potential of paying them back. So since 1990, we started with $20,000. Today, 21 years later, we have now given out $167 million Whoa. in interest-free loans, and our capital is, is $37 million. Whoa. And the way that we gave out the 167 was the capital keeps going around. As the payments come back, they go out again right away to somebody else who's waiting for a loan. And uh, we've helped over 45000 individuals and small businesses struggling to stay alive. That's, that's so, astounding. You know, when, astounding. When you talk about a gemach, you know, it's like, you know, it, it's, it's, this is the universal. It helps all people who are really citizens without regard for their, their uh, religious background or 
So that's that's the way to do it. I'm very proud of that. Oh, and many of these awards that you mentioned in the beginning about me really stem from the work of the free loan. So, so it's really from my colleagues as, as mm-hmm. over there and our staff over there as well as myself. You know, with the, the Torah concepts like you spoke about earlier, they sort of teach a Jew to be more aware of who you are and who is around you and who you could help, what, what kind of chesed you could do, what kind of acts of kindness you could do to those that need help. Right. But, but the truth is, is that social work is known to be a thankless job. It's very hard work emotionally and sometimes physically as well. And the pay is not great. And some people even call it somewhat of a volunteer job. You know, in other words, you can get you can have a master's degree and get paid minimum wage and be working 40 hours a week, come home exhausted to your own family who barely sees you. It's not so easy. It's not so easy, but you see, that's the job. That's one of the jobs and the functions of the Association of Social Workers and the, the, the workers themselves. They have to fight for their rights. They have to fight for better salaries. They have to fight for better caseload size. They have to fight for more services for their clients. I mean, we created a profession. By the way, I, didn't, I wasn't the only founder of the School of Social Work. There was a cluster of, of good people that were all working together. So, I want, you know, okay. I don't want to take I stand credit. corrected. No, right. It's really important for me because this was a team. Right. But with a team, we did our work. We created the school. We created the profession. It's now up to our graduates to fight for their rights and for the, the, for the improvement of the professional's uh, circumstances. And, you know, there was. There have been one or two strikes. The last one was a failure, unfortunately. And they have to learn how to fight for their rights, just as the nurses and the doctors and everybody else. But what's... Well, one, one thing I do agree with you, people that choose social work are a very special brand of people. They really are. They are not isolated from society. They do want to be helpful. They have a feeling for human problems. I mean, it's a blessing to watch them and to see them. Mm-hmm. I used to be chairman of admissions. And these kids, these young people, you know, are really, really different. They're special. Mm, they're givers. Yes. yes. I once heard that the difference between a child and an adult is the ability to give. A child takes. When you reach adulthood, you're supposed to become a giver. Unfortunately, some people never quite grow out of their childhood. And actually, there are some children who are givers from a very early age. But I suppose those are the ones that become social workers, right? I don't know. But, you know, <laughs> social workers also are takers. What they're taking away is the pleasure of being able to help someone. That's true. The satisfaction. satisfaction. Right. That's a tremendous part, but that's not salary. <laughs> you right. can't raise a family that. That doesn't that. feed the family, right? <laughs> Professor Jaffe, you asked me to play a John Denver song, Take Me Home. Yeah. I could guess why you asked for that song, but why, I'd like you to tell us anyway. Why that song? Well, I tell you, when I was working at, uh, when I was studying at Yeshiva University in New York, I used to work in the dorm late at night. I used to, I lived in the dorm. And I used to study late at night, the early morning hours, when it was quiet in the dorm. Everybody was sleeping. But there was a radio station that played uh, Western. And I got to hear John Denver. And I really liked this song about taking Take Me Home, you know. And while he was, his home was West Virginia, my home was mm. Jerusalem. That's right. So that's why that song kind of stuck mm. in my head. It sounds crazy, but... Because, you know, it's not Jewish and it's not, uh, you know, it's not religious Jewish. But I just, I just like it. I just like the way he sang. Also, the tragedy of his life where he was killed in an in a airplane crash. Mm-hmm. It just... Uh, it touched your heart. Yeah, it stays with me a little bit. Okay, so here we go. John Denver's Take Me Home. Thank Professor you. Jaffe, we always end our show by asking the following question. Your life that you've been leading, and Bezrat Hashem, you'll continue leading until 120 in good health, is a journey. And on your journey, you've picked up a lot of lessons that have helped you. Can you share with us some of the lessons that you think might, might assess the rest of the listeners? Uh, there is one thing that I would share with people, and that is I have a philosophy about, of life. 
and uh, which I developed over the years and, 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 and found it. What I say is that life is alone. Life itself is alone. We have to pay it back. Everybody will eventually give it back. So, you know, like what, what, I, what they say, nobody gets out alive. <laughs> but this loan carries interest. It's not an interest-free loan. And the interest that people have to pay for that loan, the gift of living, is to do good deeds, masim tovim. That's really the thing that guides me a lot, you know. We're lucky to be here. We're lucky to be born. We're lucky to be lucky to be able to help other people. This is a loan. We have to give it back. But when we give it back, after we give it back, what did we do with it? Mm. And what I like to tell people is that if you do good deeds, that's the interest that you pay for that loan. Mm. And if you keep that in mind, it's a good guidepost. You know, it's funny because I was thinking in the opposite direction that the more good deeds you do, the more interest you accrue for yourself. In other words, it's like it's like putting it in a higher interest account the more good deeds you've done. Yeah, but see, I don't think that. I don't think that my head works differently. Okay. I'm not looking for interest for okay. me. I'm not looking for, I really mean it, I'm not looking, this is accounting again. I don't want to count anything. I just want to do it. And uh, You're not looking to get back. You're looking no, to give as much as you can. No, no, wow. no, much, no. You're a very special person, Professor Jim. I don't Jim. think so. I think there are a lot of people out there, if you just, you know, if, you, if they think about it for a minute, I don't think so. There are so many people who are volunteering today. There's so many people in the nonprofit field. I mean, um, I think a lot of them are there because of the, just the pleasure that it gives to them. You know, if that's counting, okay. But not the counting, you know, another good thing that I did today. I right. never do that. You don't pat yourself on the back alone. No, you just keep no, doing. No, in fact, I, in fact, I have a hesitation when that happens. I, because once. One thing is you're never really working alone. You're always working with other people. You know, as I said before, all these these prizes and all that, that came out of the combined work of yourself and other people. A team. It's not uh, you know, one-man shows, you know, I don't think. Uh, and I think that has to be appreciated because because if people feel, oh, they got to be very special, they have to have certain knowledge, they got to be a professor – to do, you know, good things, that's absolute nonsense. That is nonsense. Anybody, anywhere, in any position, at any time, with any amount of money that they have, can do good deeds. And that's what they should do. No matter how poor you are. That's correct. You know Everyone that has de- something to offer. The default rate at the uh, Israel Free Loan Association that I told you about before mm-hmm. is less than 1%. Really? Yes, less than 1%. That's unusual. Well, there's a stereotype about poor people. I mean, you know, that they're irresponsible. That's nonsense. Hmm. They understand somebody else is waiting for that money. It's nonsense. Hmm. So they are responsible. I like that, what you just said. Because yeah. I'll tell you what, I'm, I have a thought that I'd like to share with you, Professor Jaffe. Yeah. I, I believe that sometimes poor people are given a bad rap. And even those that want to give to them, those that want to so-called help them or, or give them charity or, or money, yeah, yeah. they don't treat them with dignity. They sort of look down upon them and almost blame them for their own service, for their own troubles. And I yeah. sense in you that you have respect for every individual, no matter who he is or where he comes from, and that even when you help people, and you probably train your students to do the same, you help people in a way that maintains that dignity. That's absolutely correct. That's essential. The other thing is, you know, there's a lot of faith going on here. Let's say, you know, you and I are talking, Halina Vachas, and you have colleagues. Suppose they lose their job tomorrow, and they have mortgages, and they have responsibilities, and they have tuition for their kids, and they have medical problems. And they fall right away. In 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 one night, they could fall into a category where they need a loan. Right. It could happen to anybody. Why should we relate to, 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 to people who come in asking for loans as if they're a special, very, very special, you know what I mean? They could be anybody, and they are anybody. I'm telling you this right. from, 
what I see at the free loan, and we want to get them over a bad spot, you know. But but that's the way to look at it. There are people like everybody else that are trying to stay, you know, afloat, and it happens that that they that something hits them and they fall. So you wanna you wanna get them back on their feet. They are us, right? You know, it's not. Uh, We're looking in the mirror. That's right. And so the one lesson for that life is alone. That's really important. The second thing is that you you don't have to wait for somebody else or for government, you know, to do something that has to be done. You don't have to wait for somebody to come in and, and so to speak, save the situation. Every individual can get involved and make a difference. It's really important. It may not be today, it may not be tomorrow, but if they get in the right place at the right time with the right idea and the right friends, they can do an awful lot of, of good and change uh, for Israeli society. Our society is very young. It's evolving. It's really kind of a, in, in its infancy. And there's so much to be done. You know, we're, we don't have these hundreds of years, hundreds of years of government, of our own self-government. We have exile. And the way we cope with exile is not the way you really cope with a state. So everybody who's living in Israel, and that's why it's so important that they're in, in Israel or living in Israel, they are part or can be part of the formation and the quality and the essence of the Jewish state. These are battles, you know, because people have different ideas. But somebody who doesn't get into it, somebody who doesn't get involved, is just letting it pass by and just just uh, watching it like a movie. Mm. And I think that's wrong. I think people should be involved. There are things to do. There are really good people with good ideas. And uh, people should find, you know, their niche, what they like to do, what bothers them, and try to make a change. Mm. And they can do it. It's not a large country. It's a very small country. And they can make change. Wow. Everybody. What you're talking about is both a privilege and a responsibility. Can. No question about it. There's no question about it. Every time I go back to visit with my brothers in the States or my sister, you know, I, I always say, wow, wow, what would happen if I had stayed in the States? Where would I be? You know, I'd be in some some welfare office or managing or whatever, but, but not my people, you know, not mm-hmm. my country. I mean, I can't conceive of myself. You know, getting and doing all these things or getting involved for anybody other than my people, my country. And shaping the future yeah, for your ch- absolutely. grandchildren. Absolutely, for everybody. Right. For all the other people's grandchildren. That's right. Well, you ask, where would you be? I ask, where would the country be if Professor Eliezer Jaffe had stayed in Cleveland? We wouldn't be where we are today, I'll tell you that much. I don't know. There are a lot, a lot of good people out there, including yourself. <laughs> No, no, you know, so I agree funny. with you that there are a lot of good people out there. Totally agree with you. You've said it more than once through the course of the show. But I want to just end by saying I wish that there were more people like you. That's a nice compliment. Thank you so much for being on the show. And I want to wish you good luck and success in everything you do, both in your personal life and in your professional life, which I believe are connected. Yeah. And, uh, and we should just continue to make this place better and better day by day. Thank you, Professor Jack. You're tuned into Life Lessons. This is Judy Simon on Israel National Radio. Have a wonderful week. Shalom. Atomakshivim la Arutsheva. Israel National Radio. Dot com.